welcome back to State of the Union. I'm Jake Tapper. When the U.S. Senate reconvenes after the holidays, five current Republican senators will not be back. My next guest was elected to the Senate during the Tea Party wave of 2010. In his time in the Senate, he reached across the aisle, most notably on gun regulations, and now he's leaving a much different Republican Party than the one he joined. Joining us now is outgoing Republican senator of the Great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Pat Toomey. Senator uh, Toomey, thanks so much uh, for joining us for this exit interview, as it were. You're, you're kind of a unique figure in your party. You are a staunch conservative elected during the Tea Party wave, uh, and yet you also were willing to work across the aisle. You kept a laser-like focus on economic policy. You voted for Trump twice. You played a key role in passing his tax cuts, but you were also one of the few Republicans willing to break with him after January 6th. I guess this is kind of a tough question for somebody to answer, but what do you think your legacy as a legislator will be? Well, thanks for having me, Jake. Um, I, I can tell you this. The vast majority of my time and effort was focused on two things. One, defending the interests of my state, this great, big, beautiful commonwealth that you know well, and, um, and I may know even better than you. <laughs> uh, and also defending and trying to expand um, freedom, especially economic freedom, because I think economic freedom is an integral part of human freedom. And economically free societies are also the most prosperous and successful societies with the higher standard of living. That's what I spent the vast majority of my time on. I think some of my biggest accomplishments in the Senate were in that space. Um, so, you know, I'd like to think that'd be part of, uh, if I'm remembered at all, it would be uh, for some of those things. But I acknowledge that when you kind of uh, go against the grain, so to speak, and when you separate yourself from the consensus of your party, that tends to get more attention than anything else. So there was certainly more media coverage of my work on background checks with Joe Manchin and my vote to convict uh, Donald Trump. Uh, you know, that's that's just the I guess that's the nature of politics and the coverage of politics. Yeah. I mean, you were elected on a less taxes, less regulation platform. That was kind of your your thing as a on less the tea, government. Yeah. Yeah. Less government as a Tea Party wave. So that wasn't a surprise. Um, and obviously that was where your passion was. Right. right. Um, in your closing address on the Senate floor, uh, you had this message for your party. For my Republican colleagues, let me just say our party can't be about or beholden to any one man. We're much bigger than that. Our party is much bigger than that. Uh, it's not hard to figure out what one man you're talking about there. Do you think Republicans are increasingly receptive to that message? Do you think Donald Trump's hold on your party is finally slipping? Absolutely, I do. Uh, first, I think his influence was waning, not as quickly as I had hoped it would, but I think it was waning. But the election outcome from last month, I think, dramatically accelerates the waning. And frankly, his unbelievably terrible rollout of his re-election, well, his election campaign um, is also not helping him. So yeah, I mean, I think you see it manifested in a number of ways. One obvious way was quite an impressive turnout of prominent Republicans who have been going to events like the RJC meeting in Las Vegas, openly talking about themselves as candidates after Donald Trump had already made it clear he was running. Um, so, so that tells you that they perceive the Republican electorate to be much more open. And in my travels since the election around Pennsylvania, I've heard from many, many formerly very pro-Trump uh, voters that they think it's time for our party to move on. So yes, I think that process is underway. It doesn't, it's not a flip of a switch. It doesn't happen overnight. He still has a significant following, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, I do think his influence is waning. Let's talk about the Republican Party uh, writ large. Uh, take a look at this New York Times headline from when you were first elected in 2010. Toomey at helm of a Republican wave in Pennsylvania. When you first came here to Washington, you were seen as one of the most conservative voices in the U.S. Senate. Flash forward 12 years, and now some in the GOP, and uh, it's, it's preposterous, don't get me wrong, but some in the GOP now call you a rhino uh, because you spoke out yeah. against Trump's election lies and you were willing to criticize Donald Trump. You are far more conservative than Donald Trump by any stretch, uh, but right. still people are calling right. you a rhino. What happened to the Republican yeah. Party? 
<clears throat> oh, you know, I, 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 first of all, I think this um, kind of um, th this warping of the language will will also uh, subside. Um, you know, there is a, a, a tendency, and this happens um, on both sides of the aisle. There's a tendency to rally around the guy who's being attacked by the other side. Nobody was ever attacked more than Donald Trump was, sometimes legitimately, sometimes not. And he fought back aggressively. And so when Republicans had criticisms of him, I certainly think mine were valid, um, that doesn't always sit well uh, with folks who see him as carrying the fight to the other side. So said, some of that tribalism is, um, you know, is built into pol political systems anywhere. Again, I think as his influence wanes, the sort of conventional understanding of what words mean kind of gets restored over time. Um, I'm, not, I'm not too worried about that. You're going to be turning over your seat to a Pennsylvanian that is probably more different from you than almost anyone in politics in Pennsylvania that I can think of, uh, John Fetterman, uh, the yeah. lieutenant governor. Uh, he's going to be the next senator. Um, I know you disagree with him in policy, but beyond that, because I know you want him to be a good steward and a good senator for Pennsylvania, what advice might you offer him? Well, you know, there's the obvious things, uh, but they're really important, which is to uh, listen to your constituents. I mean, one, one of the things that's um, uh, great about Pennsylvania, the proximity to Washington meant that for 12 years, I got a lot of visits, aside from the COVID period, um, you know, people could come down and make their case. And so I had innumerable in-person meetings with every kind of uh, group of Pennsylvanian uh, for every kind of reason. You learn an awful lot when you sit down and you meet with your constituents. You may learn that some of your, your own assumptions were not entirely valid. So, so that's a really important thing. The other thing I would, uh, I would urge, and I, I did urge my Democratic colleagues, and I would extend this to Senator-elect uh, Fetterman, um, don't blow up the Senate by destroying the filibuster. That, that would be a terrible thing for America, for our government, for the Senate, certainly. It would lead to a radical increase in polarization, volatility in policy. It would be a really bad idea. So I hope he reconsiders that. I do want to ask you about one breaking news story. Um, roughly two dozen retired top military leaders uh, last night sent a letter to congressional leaders urging them to pass the Afghan Adjustment Act, which will offer a legal pathway to permanent U.S. residency to thousands of Afghans who helped the United States during the war. These top leaders, uh, you know, people like McChrystal and Dunford, they call passing the legislation a moral imperative. Veterans groups, Gold Star families, a lot of them back this legislation. Do you support including the Afghan Adjustment Act in, in this must-pass government uh, funding bill? So, so one of the problems we deal with here, Jake, is really important and challenging issues get like airdropped out of the clear blue sky onto a negotiation that is extremely opaque. This is part of the problem with the lack of normal functioning of the Senate. Look, I have been very outspoken. I think we need to have a clear path to citizenship for the Afghans who helped us at great risk to themselves and their families. That legislation exists. It, my understanding, and, and I'm not an expert in this space, but my understanding is there is nevertheless quite a backlog. Honestly, I'm sitting here right now, I can't tell you whether or not this particular bill is the best solution for that backlog. And it's the kind of thing that needs to be carefully vetted because let's face it, there could be some really bad actors trying to get that citizenship also. We need to be able to distinguish between the truly deserving and those who are not. Uh, so not the kind of thing that really ought to be just dropped in in the last minute in, you know, in a back room, this is something that ought to be scrutinized. Yeah, I would just uh, respectfully ask that you take a look at this legislation, given the fact that three joint chair, three former uh, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, yeah, a former yeah. NATO uh, Supreme Allied Commander, a lot of uh, people who had, were in charge of uh, U.S. troops in Afghanistan are calling for this legislation. I would just respectfully ask that you take a look at it. Yeah, look, their, their opinions should matter. Those are obviously very, very well-informed and thoughtful people, so their opinions do matter. All right. Senator Toomey, uh, your last time as a senator on this show, maybe you'll come back. I hope to see you yeah. again, uh, and uh, I, I really appreciate it, and, and all the time you've, you've spent on the show talking to yeah. us, talking to the American people. And Merry Christmas to you, sir. Thanks very much, and Merry Christmas to you. The